Oh, God, we desire that for our own individual lives, for this church. Lord, we desire to see a great movement of your Holy Spirit in our day. Lord, bring it to pass and help us not to fight against it, but to ride the wave of what you are going to do. God, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you worship. We ask you to bless all that is said and done in this place the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. In a minute, I'm going to invite you to, once again, as we always do, say hi to each other for a few minutes. But I want to welcome you to the nonstop victory party that we've just been singing about. And I've just been challenged, especially by this, this last song, to remember that uh, I like to plan things. I like to know what's coming next. And sometimes when God does his will and his work through us and in our midst, it doesn't go according to any of our plans. And we come along for the ride and we try to remain faithful and obedient and trusting while amazing and sometimes frightening things can happen. God is good and he is mighty. And let's just stay open to who he is and learn about him and how he wants to assign us to our tasks and assignments. And maybe that can be the theme of some of your conversations in your encouragement to each other here for the next few minutes. So go ahead and say hi to each other. Thanks.
We uh, are uh, learning to go farther and farther afield during our greeting breaks. <laughs> Everybody in the foyer, can you hear me? Come on in, please. We're ready to continue the service. Somebody can draw their attention. Yeah, yeah, maybe, uh, let me recommend that uh, it's fine if you want to grab some refreshments during the greeting break, but if you can possibly grab those before the service starts, then uh, it'll be easier for us to uh, get back to business when the time comes. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, one, we enjoyed a, a very meaningful time remembering our loved lost one, uh, well, I shouldn't say lost, that's, that's not the best word to use. Our, our, our sister, Ruth Sasser, uh, and uh, we, we had her memorial service yesterday, and if you want to, if you didn't get to be here and you'd like to uh, see that, it's on YouTube, available on YouTube. Uh, it may be available on the landing page when you go to the, the sanctuary, sanctuary Church of Gresham uh, page on YouTube. Uh, you may find it immediately. If there's not, if you have trouble finding it, let us know, and we'll get you the direct link. And then just some things related to Easter. Well, first of all, as every Sunday, we'll have our food pantry open after service today, so feel free to come over and grab some food for your family and to reach out to others. Uh, we also, uh, just some things related to Easter coming up on April 9th. Is that on your calendar? Easter, Resurrection Day. Um, a couple of things that are going to be different that day. One is, instead of a potluck, it is second Sunday of the month. We're not going to have our after-service potluck, as we often do on that, that Sunday of the month. But rather, we're going to have a brunch before service at 10 o'clock. So feel free to come for brunch and fellowship at 10 o'clock on April 9th, Easter morning. Uh, bring friends. If you think you're going to uh, bring a fair number of additional family and friends, please let Kathy Cook know so that our hospitality ministry can make sure we're equipped and ready for the larger numbers of people. And then also, I, are there still some of the cards left in the foyer? Okay. There's a, a business card-sized invitation card available uh, in the entryway in a box. And if you want to use that as an invitation to a friendly friend, family member, neighbor, uh, whoever, to join us on Easter morning for that celebration, brunch and or service, please use those cards. All right? Uh, ushers, could you please come on up? We're about to receive uh, this week's offering to uh, honor the Lord for how much he has done for us. It, all the blessings that we enjoy every day, the breath we breathe, the freedom we enjoy, the uh, education we have access to, transportation, you name it, and a connection with the eternal God that we sabotaged, and he said, okay, I'll, I'll take on the price myself and let you come back to me. I want you to come back to me. All of that in his generosity. Here we have a chance to express our gratitude for all of his blessings. And so, Lord, we, we do this again in uh, gratitude as uh, we prayed earlier, keep us grateful. Remind us to be grateful. Remind us of our dependence on you for everything. And we do pray that uh, you would continue working in our hearts and change our hearts so that when we give, it's with full eagerness and joy and in full awareness of how good you've been to us and what you gave for us. Thank you for the opportunity to give back. Receive these gifts with joy. Amen. What a hush fell over the room just then. Yeah. All right, get myself all situated here. So, yes, Brian mentioned Easter. I, let's take a quick poll looking for some honest answers, not right or wrong answers, just honest ones. How many of you have thought about inviting someone to church 
this Easter season? All right, a few of you have thought about it. That is great. How many of you have thought about someone specific that you might invite? Okay, yes, still several hands. How many of you have actually invited someone to Easter? Hey, yes, all right, we've still got some hands up. That is great, that's wonderful. Okay, um, you know, it, it's... Sometimes I think we get hung up on inviting someone to church like that's a really hard thing. Do you know where that, in general, where that idea that inviting someone to church is a hard thing comes from? It's from the culture outside telling us that it is offensive to some people or dangerous or inappropriate to invite them to church. That's not, that's not God or his spirit telling us that it's a hard thing to invite people to church. That's the culture around us telling us that. And I don't know about you, but I, and I don't succeed 100%, I'm sure, but I try very hard not to let a culture of people who are not following God tell me how to follow God. Amen. Right? So if you've been thinking, uh, I know who I'd like to invite to church. I know someone I could invite to church. I know someone who needs church, right, who doesn't know Jesus yet, or who does know Jesus but hasn't been going to church for whatever reason. Some of you know people like that. Don't let the culture around you tell you when is the appropriate time to invite them to church. Hear what I'm saying? Okay. I've, I've learned recently, incidentally, while attending a memorial service or two, that many people here in the room know not just one or two, but potentially lots of folk who consider themselves Christians and most likely are, but who have not been going to church for whatever reason. And there's a variety of reasons out there. Easter seems like the perfect, easiest moment to invite someone who already considers themselves a Christian to church, doesn't it? So I encourage you, don't be shy. Don't be bashful, and don't let the culture outside of the church tell you this is a hard or dangerous or inappropriate thing to do. Mm, that's not true. That's a lie. It's a joyous and wonderful thing to be able to do. The other day, I was thinking of someone in particular who had talked to me about the fact that they had not been back to church since COVID hit, and um, they still hadn't gone back, and it was hard to do. It was hard to make that change, and I'm, I'm confessing right now. Can I do a little bit of confessing? There are times when I have looked at such people with a... Uh, a kind of a scolding tone in my spirit. Hopefully I didn't bring that out in the way that I treated them. But they were in my heart, I felt like, come on, you call yourself a Christian, get to church, get over it. I don't know that that's wrong, but I do think it wasn't helpful. So while I was talking to this person, the thing that hit me, and I think this was the spirit of God rather than just me, was uh, pity and mercy. God, they were trying to do it on their own. It's hard to do it on your own, to be a Christian without the support of the church. It's hard. That poor person that I was speaking to was trying to battle through the spiritual warfare that we all go through as Christians alone. Maybe inviting somebody to church is an act of mercy. Inviting them back to a place where they'll find strength that maybe they haven't had for a long time, if ever. It's a thought that ties in with our, our topic today. What is the church? Um, last week, we talked about the Trinity in this series on the basics of Christian theology how in the Bible God describes God's self as one God in three persons, 
how the three-in-one-ness of God shapes what it means to be a Christian, and how God is and always will be too big for us as humans to fully understand. Continuing our talks about the basics of Christian theology for today's topic, we're going to do something that's kind of a little bit strange if, if I think about it overly much. We, the church, are going to ask the question, what is the church? Which you might think is, is unnecessary since we're a church, right? Well, what's the church? Well, I, I hope some of us already have a, an idea of what the church is. Um, but even so, in order to avoid letting the culture outside the church tell us what the church is, we have to go back to the Bible to remember what it ought to be, what God says it is. Before we do that, let's acknowledge some common uses of the word church. I'd say most of the time when somebody says the word church, both Christians and non-Christians, just general, just fine uses of the word church, they might be referring to a building, a property, or an organization. Do you think that's often true? It's true of me. Um, when I say I'm going into the church, when I say, uh, I left my phone at the church, I mean a building, right? I mean a, a physical place. Um, someone might also say, I am, I am volunteering with the church, maybe. I'm feeding the hungry with the church. And in that case, they're probably talking about an organization, a, a group of people that are doing something together. But even that definition is partial. It's not false, but it doesn't cover the whole of what the church means and is and ought to be. If you'll please open your Bibles with me, if you have them today, to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be staying in Ephesians today. I have most of the scriptures up here on the slides also. Okay, sorry, I double pressed there. Thank you very much. Uh, we're starting in Ephesians chapter 1, the first couple of verses. Mostly we're going to be diving deep today and covering a lot of scripture in Ephesians 4. But we need to read a couple of verses here so we know about who the audience is, who the book of Ephesians is written to. The book of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul as he is writing who this letter is to, addresses people that he describes as holy and faithful. We're going to need to remember that as we move forward. I'll keep coming back to that. Okay, I'll let that be for now. So, Paul is talking to Christians in the book of Ephesians. He's talking in particular to a group of Christians that lives and exists and meets together in Ephesus. And he describes them as holy and faithful. That's our preface, if you will. Now we're jumping down to chapter 4, and we're going to cover a lot of chapter 4 today. So if you brought your Bibles, just leave your Bibles open there. He continues writing in chapter 4, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is a great deal that we could say from these verses. I want to start with observing that the church is both local and universal. 
the church is both local and universal. And you're probably thinking, I don't think it said that. What's he, what's he getting at here? Notice that Paul is writing to a particular group of Christians, the Christians in Ephesus. By the Holy Spirit inspiring the way that Paul wrote, this letter was also intended for all Christians, including us. But when Paul wrote it, he was thinking mostly about these Christians in Ephesus, a local congregation. And he challenges them, asks them to keep the unity within the church. And then he gives a bunch of good reasons to focus on and value that unity. But the reasons that he gives are not particular to Ephesus. They weren't particular to that church. They apply equally to all Christians everywhere. And even every when, if you will. All Christians. He didn't say to the Christians in Ephesus, I want you to be united, and this is why. Remember so-and-so, who's an important member of your congregation, and how you all came together to help them when uh, their, their farm, something happened at their farm. And it, he, he doesn't give specific reasons to the church in Ephesus. He's talking to a local congregation, and the reasons he gives them to preserve unity are universal to Christians. You follow me? Which means those Christians in Ephesus, for those same reasons, were also to be united with the Christians in Corinth and the Christians in Rome and the Christians in Jerusalem and everywhere that there were Christians, all of those reasons applied. He says there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Is that particular to Ephesus? Not at all. In fact, does it apply to Christians today? In Gresham? Yes? Yes, it does. These are reasons for us to be united also. And these reasons connect us, or ought to, not just with each other, but with the Christians in Ephesus thousands of years ago. And the Christians today who are suffering in Myanmar. And also with the Christians down the street at the Baptist church or the non-denominational church or the Lutheran church or the Catholic Church, or the Coptic Church, any church that teaches and believes from what the Bible says and believes that all people have sinned and require Jesus' forgiveness for salvation. One Lord. One baptism. One hope of salvation. Paul's reasons here hold true for all people who are Christians, everywhere, and even every when. So the church is both local and universal. It's a big idea, not just a close idea. The church is, or should be, united throughout space and time. We are parts of this one body. You know, when we talk about the church being one body and everybody is a different part of it. I most often apply that teaching to the congregation that I'm in. That's what I tend to think of. I tend to think we are one body and we are all parts of that body. And that is a true application and very important. But it's also true that we are all parts of a much larger body called the church. And it has spanned centuries and continents. When I think of us in this particular church family as one body, then the analogy that the Bible uses in one place of maybe one person is like an eye and one person is like a hand, the, the number of parts about makes sense. When I think of the whole church everywhere, universal as one body, 
I'd have to think of myself as more like a single cell because the body is huge. I think of the church, the body of Christ, in different kinds of layers. It's just the way my brain compartmentalizes it. Some of those layers are geographical, right? Think of the Christians in this church. Think of all the Christians in this city. Think of all the Christians in this country. Think of all the Christians at this time in the world. Think of all the Christians from now until the time of Christ. It, it, it rings out like a tree, doesn't it? And then you can also think of it um, kind of theologically in church families. Think of all the Christians that, that I know and have read the Bible with. Think of all the Christians that I know in churches that I've been a part of. I think of all the Christians that are free Methodist. Did you know there are far more Christians that are free Methodist in particular in other countries than there are in the United States? Lots more. It's booming. It's crazy. The bishops aren't even allowed to tell us how much the Christian church is growing in some parts of the world because the Christians there are being persecuted. So they're not supposed to share specific information because the internet makes it possible for that information to leak back and put people in danger. The Free Methodist Church is growing in places that I don't even know there are Free Methodist Churches there at all. Isn't that crazy? Next ring out, think of all the churches that Free Methodist Churches perhaps would say they agree with mostly. Another ring out, all the churches that preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ and might disagree about a great many secondary things, but on everything that's important that makes us Christians, we agree. I'm just blown away. I know I'm repeating myself here, but the church is both local and universal, and I find that important to remember. Now, I am a free Methodist on purpose, I'm thankful for the strengths that come from being part of a group that does agree on even the specifics. And I'm thankful for many of the things that, in my opinion, make the Free Methodist Church distinctive. But that's a different set of sermons. Focusing today on the unity of the church, the church is broad. And that's important for me to remember in my relationship with God because it keeps me from being selfish and self-centered. It keeps me from thinking that what God is doing is primarily right here. God is doing work right here, but he's also doing it in so many other places that I can't name. Let's read further in Ephesians chapter 4. I think this is the correct verse, but I forgot to change the header. This is verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 
Here we learn that God has given us who are in his body, who are parts of his church, different kinds of gifts and skills for leadership so that we can all become mature in faith and in knowledge, it says. God has gifted those in his church so that we can all become mature in faith and in knowledge. This, I feel, strongly implies that in faith and in knowledge, we're not yet complete. We have further that we can go. We have more that we can learn. We can become stronger in our faith. We can become more complete and more secure in our knowledge of God. This is why God has given spiritual gifts to people in the church. Not just for their sake, but for the sake of the whole body. Are you with me here? God gives you one spiritual gift or more than one, and the person next to you a different gift, and the person next to them a different gift, and me a different gift. And the result is we need each other. Because I do not have the same spiritual gifts that you have, but I do need to benefit from them. And you maybe don't have the same spiritual gifts that I have, and so God gives gifts to his people so that the whole body may grow up and mature in faith and in knowledge. We need each other like parts of a body, right? Is anybody here aware of a strength that they have? This is not boasting. This is praising the Lord. Are you aware of a strength that you have that is given to you by God? I hope that if you don't, you all come to be aware of the fact that God has given you certain strengths. Has anybody in the room ever benefited from a strength that God gave a different Christian sister or brother? You said, yep, I needed the gift that God gave that person. That's what I needed, and I didn't have it. Praise the Lord. That's how it's supposed to work. We're parts of a body. We are incomplete on our own. God has gifted those in his church so that we can all become mature in faith and in knowledge. Let's keep reading. The next section of scripture we're going to read, I have not put on the screen because it's just too long. And so for those who rely on that, I apologize, but it would have been like 30 slides. And we've just been going click, 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 click. Um, I've mentioned before, sometimes I bring up a passage that's so short, I've got to read it two or three times because it goes by so fast. Other times, to get the full picture of what God is saying, I can't do it in a verse or two. You have to read a section. you got to let the Bible preach instead of just me, right? My voice, I hope you all know this, is a secondary voice and not a perfect one. This is the primary voice we're here to listen to, right? So sometimes if you're saying, Pastor Luke is reading like four pages of the Bible and not stopping to comment on them. Well, at least then you can be sure that you're getting the truth right. <laughs> right? <laughs> sometimes we've got to read a big section. I'm opening my Bible. If you have your Bibles with you, please open them with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. We're just continuing where we left off, but I'm going to tackle a large section here. I had someone once ask me why I don't bookmark my Bible before a sermon when I intend to open the Bible and read from it um, right off the page. I said, well, that would kind of be cheating if I get to go straight to the page and nobody else has time to open their Bible. So <laughs> when I'm intending to read from my Bible in a sermon, I don't bookmark the page because I know anybody else who's brought their Bible has got to find the page themselves. Okay, this is the book of Ephesians chapter 4, and we are picking up at verse 17, and we're going to read clear down through the end of the chapter. So if you don't have your Bible with you, just engage your imagination 
and treat these words as the sermon because they're better than the rest of the sermon, okay? All right, Ephesians 4, 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There's a lot of instruction in this reading. Paul is either teaching or perhaps scolding the people that he's writing to, helping them see or remember that a variety of different choices people make are just wrong and we can't have that continue. There needs to be a growing up, a maturing in righteousness in the Christian church. In the Christian church. Hold on. Remember verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 that we started with? Remember who he's writing to here? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to people that he described on page one as holy and faithful. Paul had to tell people he could describe as holy and faithful to quit stealing? Paul had to tell people that he described as holy and faithful to quit hating. Did you know that Christians struggle with sin? If you're a Christian, you know that because you've had a struggle with sin. So if anybody ever says, no, Christians don't struggle with sin anymore, they're experiencing a little bit of denial of self there, right? They're, they're, yeah, yeah. Or trying to think, maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm the only one who's still struggling with sin and I don't want to let people know that. Christians struggle with sin, okay? We do. That's important to recognize because if we pretend it doesn't happen, we're not being very humble, Right? claiming accolades that maybe we haven't received yet. Christians still battle with sin. The church is both imperfect and holy. Paul describes these people as holy and faithful. But apparently they weren't perfect yet, right? If he had to tell them, quit stealing stuff, right? <laughs> They had more growing up to do in their faith, and so do I, and probably so do you, and so do we as a body, yes? The church is both imperfect and holy, and if we hadn't read Ephesians 
chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, where Paul tells who he's writing this book to, I think I would have thought this passage was not being directed toward Christians, but it is. Christians sometimes battle with sin. And the Christians in Ephesus were apparently still very much engaged in that battle. And probably many of us, certainly me, are still very much engaged in that battle. If you've ever looked for the perfect church, you've probably discovered that there aren't any. And if you find a church that believes itself to be perfect, you've probably discovered its flaw right there. The church is a group of forgiven people. The way in which the church is described as holy, there are two, really. Christians are holy by virtue of the holiness of Jesus being put over us, covering us. It means that when God looks at us, he considers us and treats us as holy, even though I'm still imperfect. There's also a second sense, also very important, in which it can be said that Christians and the church are holy. And that's that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are becoming more like Christ. Amen? Amen. Is there anybody who can give testimony to the power of God by saying, yes, when I look at myself today and when I look at myself a year, two years, ten years ago, Christ has made me more like himself. I've made progress. Yes? Thanks be to God. That's not boasting. That's giving credit where credit is due. If God has made a difference, we got to be honest about that. And God has made a difference in me. I'm not the same guy I was 10 years ago, and 10 years ago I was a Christian, but I'm slowly becoming more like Christ, and that's how it's supposed to work. We are holy in these two respects. The holiness of Christ covers us, and the Spirit of God is making us more holy in actuality, but that doesn't mean we're perfect. It's good news that Paul doesn't tell these Christians in Ephesus, okay, you're imperfect, just put up with each other. Deal with that, right? You're messed up, you're always going to be messed up, oh well. Paul does not say that, right? Instead, he tells them, and God tells us today, that when we see these imperfections in ourselves, when the Holy Spirit points out to me, Luke, here is a place where your heart is still not the same as my heart and you have growing to do, we are called to change. By the power of the Spirit, we are called to change. What I'm trying to say here is that Christians are holy because the holiness of Jesus covers us, and we are also becoming holy because the power of the Holy Spirit enables us. Christians are holy because the holiness of Jesus covers us, but we are also, in addition to that, becoming holy because the power of the Holy Spirit empowers us. If you want the $10 words, the words that we tend to refer to these two different expressions of God's grace are justification and sanctification. Justification means because I have accepted Jesus' gift of forgiveness, my relationship with God has been made right in a moment happened when I accepted his forgiveness. But there's another expression of God's grace that is gradual by which, and this is amazing, God is willing to change me and make me more like himself. And that expression of grace we call sanctification. And it's not momentary. It's a thousand different moments where God brings me along step by step and makes me new. Justification and sanctification. So how do we apply this? What does it mean for us in our lives together as a local church to know that the church is imperfect as its members are imperfect? 
but holy according to the holiness of Jesus and being made more like Jesus. Well, it means that different people who are part of the church family here may be in very different places in our walk with Christ, right? If we're all moving in a process guided by the Holy Spirit, we might be in very different places in that process. And that does not mean that some of us are more the church than others. The church is made up of all of us, wherever we are in that walk. There are some people in the church, some people in this church, who hardly ever sin anymore, at least in ways that they can be aware of. Because God has led them along through the years in sanctification. I'd be willing to bet that many of you, if you try right now, can think, and don't say a name or anything like that, can think of a Christian you know who you think, I bet that person has not done anything that they are aware is sin for years. I'd like to be like that. I trust that the Lord is taking me there. There are some of us who are that far along. There are others of us who experience our Christian faith as a battle every day. Amen? Constantly a battle. And temptation is very real, and you don't need me to convince you that it's real because you know it. I know it. Some of us are there in our process of sanctification. Some of us are further back in the process than that, and we're still learning from God which things in our life count as sin. And we're so fresh in our commitment to Jesus, and Jesus is so gentle that he's still pointing out this also does not please me. You may not have known it before. We're going to work on this. We're going to change this. Will you give this to me also? And some of us are even a step earlier in our walk with Christ where we're not actually Christians yet, have not made a commitment, have not asked for Jesus' forgiveness. We're just here because we're clinging to faith, hoping that there is an answer there that will be enough. Be enough for us in our times of need. Be enough to make sense of our difficulties in life. But we haven't made the decision yet. Even these people are part of the church. The church is not yet perfect. If you are that last group of people that I described, the ones who are here because you're hoping that there's something here worth grasping onto, worth living by, something big enough, something strong enough to be worth giving your life to, that's a decision that you can make today. It's a decision that you can make today. And shouldn't wait to receive God's forgiveness, to make the commitment, to choose to follow, and start receiving the benefits that comes from the Spirit of God being a part of your life. The forgiveness, justification, happens all at once. The change is gradual. Both of them are parts of the new life that Jesus promises us. Wherever you are in your walk of faith, know that you belong here. This is a family. This is a body of all different parts. Know also that this church is not the whole deal, and we don't think we are. We're just a piece of a very large body of Christians that is spread around the world. And there's a great deal of variety in that body. But one thing we have in common, we've put our faith in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of our sins. Know that we aren't perfect. And if you are here today hoping that you'll find that perfect spot with perfect people who can show you how to be perfect, this isn't that. 
There is no such place. There is no such body. But if you're looking for people who are also aware of their brokenness and seeking to grow and find healing in Christ, this is one of those places. This community needs the gifts that God has given you, even if you don't know what your gifts are yet. You have a part to play in God's plan to show God's love to the world. So what is the church? Church is local. We are a body of Christians right here in this community. The church is global, and we're only a small part of everything God is doing in the world. The church is imperfect because the people in it are imperfect. The church is holy because Christ who is in the church is holy. The church is gifted by God so that everyone in it can mature in faith. And wherever people share the good news of Jesus Christ and God's plan to reconcile us to God, wherever people put their faith in that forgiveness, wherever people seek to respond in faith to the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit, that's the church. We are a church together. But by the grace of God, we are able to do important work in God's kingdom, where we are. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, I'm grateful that I'm part of your church. I'm thankful that you invited me in. I'm thankful that you have changed me and continue to change me. I'm thankful that you're not done yet because I know I'm not there yet. God, please guide us as we seek to invite more people into this family. Guide us as we seek to share the goodness of what it means to be your children, your family, your church. I pray, Lord, that now, even now in this moment, and as this season progresses toward the celebration of Easter, that you would bring to mind for each and every one of us someone who we should invite not just to invite to a service or an event or a brunch, certainly that, but to be part of the family. Show us people who are in need of that, whether they know it or not. And then give us courage to bring them in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, we're going to sing a hymn together as we wrap things up this morning. And I'll tell you, this hymn is chock full of theology. There is a lot of truth packed into these four verses. And so I'd invite you to consider that as we sing. You'll hear some echoes from Ephesians 4. Let's stand and sing together. The church is one foundation. You might need to transpose, Jane. Really? No, I, I need to transpose. Was trying to pin that on me. I was. I was. It didn't work. You just you just wait. I'll push this button right here. <laughs>
Tell me if I get it wrong. The doctor says you've healed so quickly from your surgery, they cannot explain why. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Sister, what? Cancer free. Cancer free. Praise the Lord. Sisters and brothers, on that wonderful and grateful note, go with the strength that comes from having the Lord with you. Go in addition with the strength that comes from knowing you belong to the family of God. And may you every day have gratitude for sanctification and continuing courage to participate in God's efforts in you in, in sanctification. <laughs> Got my tongue tied up there a little bit. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. Amen.